What up, y'all? It's your hometown hero, Scott Lane, the Black Bruce Wayne, a.k.a. the real Adam Coleman. So, you ride with your ID. Uh, man, listen, I'm very excited about the guests we have today. Uh, in a previous episode, I talked about what inspired me to do this show. Yeah, I launched it a couple months ago. And I have to say, when I first started, I came across the Jew 3 Project online, uh, Jew3project.com. And I was amazed at the work that they were doing, particularly in regard to urban apologetics. I honestly didn't realize that there was other folks out there doing it. You know, so that was like a breath of fresh air. And it basically kickstarted what I'm doing now. Anyone who finds themselves involved in engaging people in the African-American context with apologetics knows we have our work cut out for us. And my guess here is most certainly about that life. So as we proceed to give you what you need, I'd like to welcome Lisa Fields, president of Jude 3. How's it going there? I'm doing great. How are you doing? Doing pretty good. Doing pretty good. So um, I caught up with you a couple weeks ago at the uh, EPS conference. I checked out your, your presentation and whatnot. That was very professional, very on point. And uh, definitely appreciate the work you're putting down at the Jude 3 Project. So I guess if you could just kind of introduce yourself to our listeners and, you know, what you're about, what you got going on and that sort of thing. Um, well, my name is Lisa Fields. I'm the founder and president of the Jude 3 Project. And the Jude 3 Project is a Christian apologetics organization dedicated to equipping the African-American community. We want our community um, to know what they believe and why they believe it. And um, I am from Jacksonville, Florida. Um, I graduated in, um, from the University of North Florida um, for undergrad with my degree in communications and religious studies. And then I have my Master's of Divinity from Liberty University. Um, I think that's a, that's that's all I got. <laughs> well, well, I think that's all you need. I mean, <laughs> you're definitely, that's like three or four, what, two or three degrees there. So that's, that's all right. That's all right. We got somebody educated here on the show today. That, that's okay. Um, question that I had, definitely a question I had. I, I don't want to jump too far ahead. But one thing I found interesting as I was listening to um, the Jew 3 Project the first time, that I heard you guys is um, just the diversity of, of thought, I guess I could say, in terms of the, the guests that you have on the show, you sharing your perspective. Is that something that just kind of planned or did it just kind of fall into place that way? You just have a, a really good variety of different perspectives. Is that something that you guys aim toward or is it just something that just kind of happens? Yeah, it's very strategic. Um, mm -hmm. It came from my time in my first year of seminary, I attended this event called the Academy of, of Young Preachers. And it's really something that's popular amongst more of mainline um, Protestant um, seminarians. And they go there. Um, it's an annual conference, the yearly, con the yearly big conference is in different cities, but that particular year was in Atlanta, Georgia. Mm -hmm. And they have seminarians from Yale, Harvard, um, Vanderbilt, Wake Forest, all the major schools, um, Morehouse, um, School of Religion, and just in different seminarians present a message in front of in front of their peers and in front of deans of schools. And um, then they have like these preaching circles where if you're if you um, all the speakers get in a circle and they split it up between the, there's like no they cross denominations and schools. Mm -hmm. So they mix everybody up mm -hmm. in these circles. And so I found those uh, preaching circles very helpful because you get to see there's Episcopalians, there's Catholics, mm -hmm. um, there's Methodists, um, uh, Church of God in Christ, AME, and it's black, white men and women. And you get to see all these different perspectives that you never, if you're in your bubble mm -hmm. of your denomination, you would never get to hear of how people approach text, what they think about scripture, how they interpret scripture and all those things. And so I was like, man, we really need that in conservative evangelical spaces because I think 
we sometimes get used to hearing ourselves talk about things Mm -hmm. without realizing there's a group of people who actually spend their whole life studying scripture and come out in a different way. And if we could just talk to each other and sharpen one another, um, I think we would, it would be helpful. So um, that kind of, that, that experience kind of bled into what I do with the Jude 3 project because I think it's important for people to know the different voices out there and to start hearing each other. Interesting, interesting. And so now I got, you know, pardon me, I don't know if you've heard, you know, uh, for some of those who haven't listened to the show before, I do ask a lot of questions because I'm, I'm just a very inquisitive person. And so something you said uh, I thought was interesting where you said there's, you talked about diversity in terms of maybe doctrinal backgrounds or, or denominations. And then I'm kind of thinking about you, you then have another level, I guess, of diversity in terms of whether it be ethnicity and those type of things that we kind of have in the church. And I'm kind of wondering from your position, like kind of how do you navigate that? You know, like do you kind of incorporate that into your, your show and, and or do you take that into account, I guess, as you're recording and things like that? As far as like ethnic diversity? Yeah, because, I, you know, in the same way that it may be difficult for um, – let's say a, a person who is a Calvinist to, you know, have certain conversations with Armenians, you know, it may also be mm-hmm. difficult for uh, Caucasian brothers to have certain conversations with African-Americans or African-Americans with Hispanics or what have you. So do you find yourself mm-hmm. kind of having to navigate that in the context of what you guys do at Jude 3? Yeah. Um, one of the things that uh, I developed at Jude 3 is something called Courageous Conversations, where it intentionally puts people that may be at odds uh, doctrinally and and racially together. Um, so one of the examples of that would be our courageous, our the last courageous conversations we did with uh, Dr. Otis Moss, mm. which is the pastor of Trinity United Trinity United Church in Chicago, which is he took over for Jeremiah Wright. Mm. Um, so he's um, and then we had Matthew Hall, which is the dean at Boyce College. Um, and used to be the um, one of the uh, vice presidents at Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, hmm. and so obviously Matt Matt Hall is white. Uh-huh. Um, so y'all was trying to set and, it off. That's what it, <laughs> yeah. and very cons- Matt Hall is white and very conservative. Otis uh-huh. Moss is black and would be very considered liberal um, based on um, United Church of Christ would be a liberal denomination. So Mm -hmm. intentionally putting them together and talking about racist evangelical history Mm. on a Google Hangout. Mm -hmm. Um, And we did that because we know that there's not only a denominational tension, but there's a racial tension. And sometimes that racial tension is, is more difficult than the doctrinal tension that can be present in, in conversations. Mm-hmm. And uh, it mm-hmm. went very well. I think uh, Matt Hall was very gracious, and and Otis Moss was very gracious in conversation, and they tr- and they were very respectful of one another. Mm-hmm. And one of the things I think um, Dr. Hall did well was he acknowledged up front the racism that's been prevalent in evangelicalism mm-hmm. and in evangelical heroes. Mm-hmm. And so him acknowledging that up front kind of made the conversation a little bit easier because he wasn't ignoring the reality. Sure. He was upfront with it from the from the get go. And so most of the time people just want you to be honest about history. And if you're honest, it kind of disarms them. Um, so, well, I mean, the fact that y'all had that conversation go down without somebody getting cussed out, I think it's pretty impressive. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty impressive right there is a, a holiday miracle, I guess, maybe. But um, <laughs> but yeah, but yeah, kind of getting back to, to um, your roots in it. You know, a lot of people, um, maybe, well, I don't know if it's fair to say a lot, but I've, I've met a number of people who are getting into the apologetics thing and, and you know, have an interest in it. Um, but one thing I kind of wondered about in, in your case, what moved you from just being interested in Christian apologetics um, to actually launching a ministry in it? And kind of what moved you to take that step? Um, well, my, I was, I didn't like grow up interested in apologetics, theology or anything. I grew up in the church. My father's a pastor Mm -hmm. and I just, I knew the Bible. I, you know, was taught the Bible throughout, throughout my life. Um, had a very, um, good knowledge of scripture. However, I didn't, I never questioned scripture until my second year of college when Mm -hmm. I took a new Testament course. 
and my professor was throwing all of these things at me and I had no idea mm -hmm. what textual criticism. I had no idea the formation of the canon and our textbook was Bart Ehrman. So if you oh, know snap. anything about assessment uh, studies and you know, Bart Ehrman is very liberal, right. uh, used to be fundamentalist and now is agnostic. Um, I think he goes from agnostic. Some would say he's agnostic. Some might say he's atheist. Depending on who you are, I think he would label himself agnostic from last I heard. Uh, mm -hmm. But he he has some very harsh criticism on scripture mm -hmm. and is one of the leading scholars in New Testament in the liberal world and teaches at UNC Chapel Hill. So that was my entry to the study of theology, Bart Ehrman. Wow. So I really wrestled with scripture um, because of that experience and because because of that experience, my father introduced me to Ravi Zacharias hmm. and I got, I started just listening to his podcast um, because I was really struggling and that experience and, you know, researching articles related to apologetics and the reliability of scripture mm -hmm. really led me on this path um, to really trying to figure out what I believed and why I believed it. And on that journey, I realized there weren't many African-Americans doing this. And I was like, somebody should fix that. Well, later on down the line, you have the G3 project, which tries to help to to fix that. But um, that's kind of what led me to that. I wanted to I wanted to see myself in the field of apologetics. And when I mean see myself, I mean see African Americans. And so um, that's kind of why I started the G3 project because I I realized there was nothing else out there like it. And there were other people who were probably sitting in a class just like me, having the same struggles and wanted to see themselves being being the people that helped navigate them through their struggle. Mm -hmm. And so that's why the G3 project kind of is, exists. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, we really don't see a lot of um, African-Americans, I think, represented in the apologetics world. You know, is that it's, it's funny. You remind, I remember. um maybe about two years ago when I was just really starting to kind of make that shift in terms of actually being active in apologetics, I went to a um, RZM, RZIM event. I think it was Stuart McAllister, you know, and it's, it's, I, it's funny. I'm, I'm a lot more chill now, but I kind of went up in there expecting for there to not really be any black people. So I'm like, yo, I got to represent, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> it's like, it's not really going to be yeah. too many up, up there. So I was like, yo, I got to, I got to represent for my peoples or whatever. I'm kind of more chill now, but, but it's definitely true. I mean, you know, we just don't see a lot of that. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll probably come back to that in a second. I want to kind of ask you why, why that you might think that is. Um, but I'm, I'm, if you could maybe kind of explain the name Jude 3 Project, what's kind of behind that name? Um, it comes from Jude uh, 1 and 3 when he, uh, Jude tells to earnestly contend for the faith. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't even know why. I think... This is more of a, it, it wouldn't be like a super spiritual thing. <laughs> okay. But when I was thinking through uh, the Peter passage, um, when he tells you to be able to give a defense for the hope that you have, mm -hmm. and Jude 1 and 3, I had this whole idea when I first had the thought of Jude 3 of like a actual ring and a boxing match, and, mm -hmm. and I had like this whole idea of how I want to decorate the website, and so that was my <laughs> reason for going with that passage versus the Peter passage. So it's nothing like super spiritual or deep. Uh, it was really more of a, a creative thing, and it, it's funny because I didn't even go with the ring type design. So, right. uh, <laughs> so originally you was trying to scrap it out with folks. You was trying to really get it in. <laughs> well not really I just thought it would be a cool design to have like a ring and just as a background for a website so it was okay. just more of a creative thing <laughs> I got you I got you but looking back on it now I think that was a better decision not to go with the ring uh, it might give the wrong idea for for the conversations that need to be had <laughs> right, right. <laughs> right. But kind, of, kind of conflictual but that's alright though that's alright <laughs> um, so kind of going back to, you know, you were sharing your experiences about, um, you know, going to, going to college, you know, having that class and really being confronted with, um, I guess, ch you know, challenges to the faith, you know, in regard to the Bart Ehrman thing. And, um, and actually I, I did hear recently that he's moved from being an agnostic leaning towards atheism to a full blown atheist. Now I, I recently heard that. Oh, wow. So that's unfortunate, you know, obviously, 
Um, so, so I guess what I would ask, you know, it, pretty much you're just you're the way you describe your situation is kind of common. I think, you know, um, it happens to a lot of folks. I keep hearing, you know, running to people on the internet or just running to people in real life, you know, who had a similar experience, who came across questions that they didn't have answers to, and then, um, you know, just either walked away from the faith or just really struggling. And um, I guess, you know, from your perspective, what do, what do you feel like the church needs to do? I mean, like, you know, why does the church need apologetics? You know? Um, I feel like the church needs apologetics because especially in the African-American community, um, I always uh, talk about somebody who's uh, very, uh, has been very pivotal, 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 um, mm-hmm. shall I say, and I'm struggling to get that word out. Sorry. Um, yeah. In my theological development as of late would be J.D. Otis Roberts. And he talks about um, he talks about classical apologetics in his book, Liberation and Reconciliation of Black Theology. And he starts talking about that in the African-American context, the struggle is with not with the existence of God, but with the character of God. But I believe it's hmm. in the Atlanta Star it was either Atlanta Black Star article or BT article about the recent um, the recent drive in the African American community of atheism, like the increase of atheism in in our in our context. Mm-hmm. And I was just thinking through just the other day why that is, and I feel like one of the reasons um, is that we don't give people the freedom to question sometimes in the Black Church. Mm-hmm. And so because of that, it's kind of like you can't question God. You can't ask questions. People kind of wrestle within themselves. Mm-hmm. And I think theology should be done in context of the community. And if you don't give mm-hmm. people the freedom to do that in community and they have to do it within themselves and not have the freedom, sometimes they come up with the wrong conclusions. They find the wrong information on the Internet. Um, mm-hmm. And then they jettison everything that they once believed. And so I think because we're in the information age, people are meeting people of different faiths. People are, they have a lot more questions. We're in the information age, we're social media, where you could talk to people that are Muslim. You could talk to people um, that are Buddhist. You could talk to people True. that are like Hebrew Israelites. Right. All with the, just, just opening your, your, your computer. You can have a conversation and get different perspectives you need to be able to navigate through those conversations. You need to be able to ask the questions that are there. And I think that apologetics is a helpful, a, the tool to help you navigate through those spaces. And that also helps you strengthen your faith. Um, because I think of faith that can't be tested, can't be trusted. And sometimes people are afraid to test their faith mm-hmm. because the fear that they don't have something that's authentic, but, uh, as as Craig Hazen famously famously all says in his lectures that Christianity is testable. So if there if it's testable, then that means there's evidence that proves it, and that mm-hmm. evidence kind of is 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 shown through apologetics. Got you, got you. That makes a lot of sense. And and I'm kind of I'm kind of chewing on it as as you're talking, but I'm thinking about so so with you guys tackling a lot of the do you, well, do you prefer to say urban apologetics or do you just call it black apologetics? Which way do you kind of frame it? I call it black apologetics. Um, okay. And I have this, I had this article that I wrote uh, uh, last year, I think, mm-hmm. uh, or it might have been earlier this year because I keep thinking we're in 2017 already, but gotcha. it's still 2016. <laughs> but uh, right. the, uh, I call it black ap- apologetics simply because I didn't grow up in an urban environment. Mm-hmm. I grew up black middle class and so in kind of suburbia so i i i don't think when we make i think black people are it's not just like a certain type of black person and so when people think that urban is kind of synonymous with black but then it's like no there's black people that are have never been in urban environments Mm -hmm. and then suburbia so i'm ju3 is kind of for all black people whether they're urban, suburbia, affluent, you know, whatever uh, class they fit in, G3 Project kind of tries to to help them navigate through apologetic issues. So sure, I, sure. I always apologetics. 
Yeah, so I mean, just because you're black doesn't mean you came up in like a hood ratchet, you know, type situation, <laughs> you know. Because <laughs> I, I didn't either. I came up, you know, same way. I had a mom and a dad, middle class background, that kind of a thing. But but you're right. I think when, you know, I'm even going to say it. I think even in the the recent election, you know, it seemed as though mm. the black community was either you're a preacher <laughs> or you're in the hood somewhere, you know. Mm-hmm. And that's the only two conceptions of, of quote unquote black that a lot of people have. I think that's really unfortunate. So very interesting, very interesting. But I guess my, my question was, um, f- from your from your vantage point, would you say that uh, black churches have particular, I guess, apologetics needs that maybe some other churches might not? I mean, do you think that's a very real issue? Um, yeah, I think uh, one of the major issues that I think this our generation faces um, is this whole idea, especially in light of uh, in light of police brutality mm-hmm. um, right now and um, mass incarceration and slavery and the history of evangelicalism and the racism that is there. Just this whole idea of the white man's religion mm-hmm. is is there. Um, I think how we deal with suffering is 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 very is very important in our context. Um, mm-hmm. Social justice issues, um, the context of putting um, police brutality and and abortion on the same on the same kind of wavelength in in the minds of churchgoers that you know uh, we won't. We're not. We, if we're going to be pro-life, we have to be consistent from from um, conception till death, um, not just conception till birth. And so, um, those kinds of issues, social issues, I think, and uh, the history of Christianity, I think, are more specific to our community mm-hmm. uh, than other contexts. Got you, got you. And so, you know, from your perspective, how do you take, I guess, um, how do how do you take apologetics and kind of really fuse it into what's going on in the black community? How do you how do you go about contextualizing that? Um, I think we have to be really strategic um, in how apologetics looks and how it needs to look um, in the twenty first century. So. Um, one of the things that I'm really passionate about is infusing um, digital media and apologetics mm-hmm. um, and creative ways to do that going forward and interacting with people in ways that aren't so necessarily churchy. So like with the G3 project, we've done event an event at a, a more so lounge to take it out of the context of, of, of church. Mm-hmm. and have a conversation with uh, our team and just open it up for non-church goers to ask questions. Um, and the whole event was surrounded, do Black Lives Matter to Jesus? Mm-hmm. Kind of just creatively taking it out of the church context for people who aren't really comfortable with church anymore. Even They left church or they've never been comfortable with it. But asking, answering their questions on a, a place that they feel comfortable going to and engaging them that way. Cause they're never going to probably never look at, you know, uh, a RZIM clip or a, you know, or a gospel coalition or, or those mm-hmm. people who try to answer those questions. It has to be something that's taken to them, um, on their level. So those are kind of some of the ways. Um, one of the ways that I think is really important is apologetics isn't really, hasn't really been pushed in our community, in our context, sure. um, because we haven't had the, I always think of apologetics and theological studies as a privilege um, because you have to have time to reflect on these things. Um, and mm-hmm. a lot of people sometimes don't understand with the suffering that took place in the communities, in African American communities, mm-hmm. a lot of people don't have the time to just sit and reflect on these things. Uh, and so because of that, some of even our leaders aren't equipped in this area. They're equipped to help people deal with what's right in front of them. Interesting. As far as like suffering, what they're dealing with now, they might not be equipped on the deep theological reflections that people might be going through. So mm-hmm. when they say you can't question God, 
it's because sometimes it's because they don't really know how to answer the question. So right, it's better to right. throw that at people than to actually wrestle with people because they want to seem like they're authoritative and they're in the know. But if you give them a question they can't answer, then that will, that might make them look bad in their eyes. It's kind of a pride thing. So um, one of the ways we help do that is we do leadership training mm-hmm. and apologetics leaders. Oh, okay. um, and kind of try to provide safe spaces to equip le- black leaders who haven't been trained in apologetics, give them resources. Interesting. And that way they can better equip their their congregation. So That's those awesome. are just some. That's awesome. You bring up a good point. Too. I never really thought about it, but you're right. I mean, if, if you're kind of living – you know, hand to mouth and just, you know, working three jobs or whatever. And that, that's not to say that ev- that's everybody, but, you know, if you're kind of struggling in some sense or another, you don't really have time to sit around and, you know, think about the intricacies of, of, of the Trinity <laughs> or something like that. You know, <laughs> it's not to say that it's not important, but, I mean, you're trying to, you know, get that next paycheck, you know, or you mm-hmm. may be dealing with a situation with your kids or whatever it may be. You know, so it, in, in an interesting way, it's kind of like a – Kind of like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. If you don't have your needs met, you can't really do some of those higher uh, level functioning type of a thing. You know, very interesting, very interesting. So I guess I got to keep it real with you. And, and you know, I'm, I'm kind of asking this question for selfish reasons because I'm trying to figure it out myself. But, you know, when you're doing black apologetics, you know, it's for people who've been looking for something like that, it's very refreshing to them. You know, they're like, oh, wow, mm-hmm. you know, finally somebody's doing it. But at the same time, I you know, I am starting to kind of get this vibe from some of my Caucasian friends, you know, like, dog, why are you always talking about black stuff? <laughs> you know, it's like, well, <laughs> you know, so it's kind of almost like an opposite effect. And it's like, you know, I, I'm kind of chewing on how to work through that. I mean, do you do you encounter that kind of vibe? Like, do you does anybody ever question you on why this is a, to be a focus for you? Um, Yeah, it's, it's funny because I, I went to um liberty university which is probably one of the most conservative places on earth and Mm -hmm. in light of the recent election there's a lot of controversy (laughs) Um, and i actually i didn't do a lot of people do liberty online i i was liberty resident oh so i was in the heart of it okay yeah i was in lynchburg i was in uh in um in liberty in liberty city Uh um so uh, that's better than saying Lynchburg because if you just shorten it, the Lynch sounds it's off the platform. Right, right. right. Uh-huh. <laughs> but um, yeah, so I was in I was in Lynchburg, so I I you know I had classes with people, and it's funny one of one of the girls that was in my class, uh, brilliant smart girl, she was uh, Korean. And she unfollowed me on Instagram because she said I talked about too much black stuff. Wow, it's hilarious. Oh, uh, but um, one of the guys in that he uh, in that program that was a friend of mine, he was just like, man, I really think what you're trying to do to Drew Through Project is cool, but I think it's divisive because it's like, mm-hmm. what if I started uh, an apologetics organization for white people? Mm-hmm. And I was just like, well, all of them kind of are already. <laughs> it's no, if they were diverse in how they put out information then there would be no need for the g3 project Mm -hmm. but because there's not diversity um there has to be a supplement for those who are trying to get their needs met um so are trying to find out so i get i get that pushback a lot i just i kind of have just resolved in myself that you know it's it's going to people are going to critique it because they don't understand it. And I can't make white evangelicals understand the black experience. Mm-hmm. I could try, but they're essentially, they're not going to understand. It's just like me try, getting a man to understand a woman's experience. Mm-hmm. I can give you perspective, but you're never going to really get it, get it because you're not a woman. And in the same way with the black and white thing, I could give you perspective and you could be empathetic, but there's a certain level that you're not going to understand. And I can't spend my all my time trying to make you get it when I could be helping people who are in need that get it. Mm. And so I just determined, I'm just determined not to spend all my time and energy focusing on trying to make people get it that don't really, they need to understand it 
But while I'm wasting time trying to get them to get it, there's other people that are in need that are walking away from the faith that I could be directing my energy towards. Right, and right. so I just started putting my energy into that. And I mean, if you don't get it or if you think, you know, it's being prejudiced or whatever, you know, I could engage in a conversation, but I'm not going to spend my energy and write articles upon articles upon articles when I could be putting my energy towards people that actually do need this information. Sure. And so that's kind of yeah how yeah. I'm doing it. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. I was kind of, like I said, I was kind of asking for selfish reasons. I'm kind of getting that <laughs> vibe now. So I'm like, dang, you know. I mean, and it's not that, you know, it's not that you want to be offensive or that you want to exclude anybody or anything like that. But it's, it's kind of like what you're saying. I mean, if there's a gap in services, you know, so to speak, where certain people aren't being – served from an apologetic standpoint then you know we need somebody needs to do something about that right you know and i think that um and quite frankly it wasn't until i i first really started doing it for my for myself that i thought about well shoot there might be some native americans who might have some mm-hmm. things about uh christianity and somebody needs to address that or some hispanics i mean I, i'm not hispanic i'm not native american and so i can't speak to their particular um you know, needs or what have you, or questions that they, objections they may have, but I would imagine somebody probably needs to go to them as well. You know, I would think. Mm-hmm. You know, so so it is mm-hmm. very important. You know, um, so you know, kind of back to you know, you were talking about earlier, uh, you know, going to these different churches, equipping leaders, exposing different people to um, just basically you know apologetics. You know, that can be helpful in the black community. Um, what kind of barriers have you run into in your efforts to do so? Um, it, it, I think it depends on the denomination. So one of the barriers in, um, in reaching black leaders, probably black leaders who've been trained in more liberal mainline seminaries is their resistance to conservative evangelical writers. Hmm, interesting. So, um, because of their history. So, you know, we think of heroes, theological heroes that are in conservative evangelicalism that are not heroes to black people. You know what I'm saying? Wow. Um, so, you know, there are some evangelical leaders um, that own slaves that we would say, man, that they're, they're not, you know, heroic in the eyes of black people. Right. And so because of that, um, that becomes an obstacle. Um, then you have that's in more of it, the educated black circles that are are more have been trained in more mainline spaces. Then in you know your black more Pentecostal circles, there's this more idea on the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. So kind of intellect is kind of like not welcome all the time mm-hmm. that's a nice way of saying more it, of okay. on the yeah. on the spirit you know uh-huh. so you have to show that it's they're not at odds with one another so it just depends on the denomination you're going to and since we try to service all denominations mm-hmm. um i i feel like sometimes i'm a religious schizophrenic um One, there's different things that you, there's different nuances and ways to approach each group. So there's no one size fits all for apologetics in the black context because everybody has different arguments. So one of the ways you see we kind of meet these needs is we always highlight black PhDs um, Mm -hmm. as much as possible because then it's like, well, if I have someone black speaking to this particular issue, then that kind of helps people navigate um through things especially when you were dealing with like uh the black black cults and Mm -hmm. they don't want to listen to or read any books read uh, by the white man so if i'm Mm -hmm. i'm referencing a book and i say okay let me reference tom odin's book um about church history i mean you know early african well tom odin is white right so (laughs) okay while this a good book with great information, if my issue is with white people, I'm not going to, that probably wouldn't be the best book. Sure. So mm-hmm. a book by maybe like, you know, Vince Montu, 
um, thankfully, I'm so grateful that he's writing a, this book now uh, with InterVarsity Press, mm. but pointing them to that with the similar information as, as Tom Oden's book is going to be helpful to engaging people who won't read a book uh, by the quote-unquote white man. Uh, so mm. there are different nuances, I think, in in every denomination. Now, when you get to a Pentecostal denomination, if you get them to overlook, if you get them to a place where they accept intellectual information, they usually don't care if it's white or black. Um, they're not, a lot of times, not really a historical um, thing that happened um, and, and what, well, I won't even make that generalization, but they, they, they usually don't mind if it's black, a black or white author. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so it just, it depends on each context. Okay. So, you know, you, you mentioned something I, I got to bring this up, you know, um, without maybe too much detail, cause I don't know who might be listening or whatever, but, um, a couple of weeks ago at the EPS, you know, conference, you were talking about mm -hmm. contextualizing, um, you know, apologetics for the, for the black community. And, and just a second ago, you were talking about how, you know, if, if you're referring, if somebody has a problem with white people, then giving them a book written by a white person may not be effective. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, you know, I recall while I was sitting in your lecture, some people had some um, concern, you know, about the, um, I guess, the perception that we may be catering to, you know, a racist, you know, type of perspective rather than just giving folks the gospel. You know, and I felt like you handled mm -hmm. that really well. I mean, you kind of talked about how you know, really with apologetics, we're already, you know, um, in a sense, catering to different groups. You know, mm -hmm. would you mind kind of just you know talking about that a little bit? Yeah, that was probably the hardest extra I've ever done in my life. <laughs> um, <laughs> right. And it was so funny; I didn't think it would be, uh, but it, it it just goes to show, you know, even what you were asking me about, you know, people being resistant to talking about things in black culture mm -hmm. uh, in a white context. So that's a real life experience. Um, right, right, right. But uh, you know, I think it's important that you know we contextualize apologetics because you know we when we think about contextualization in the in the grand scheme of things, one of the things that I really tried to point out in my lecture. We understand this importance when we do missionary work in other countries. Mm -hmm. But when we get to America, we as we are English speaking Americans, that we can approach it the same way. And I always like to say just because we both speak English doesn't mean we both speak the same language. And so I think it's important for us when we're interacting with people of different races that we understand their contexts, we understand their experiences, and we kind of shape, um, not change the method, message of the gospel, but maybe tweak the method in which we present the gospel. Paul does this. He doesn't approach everybody the same. You mm -hmm. see him talking um, on Mars Hill. He doesn't start every conversation in Acts talking about an unknown God. He does it specifically in that context because he understands the people mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. And so, and the, how they receive information and he tries to find some common ground and work his way to the gospel that way. He becomes all things to all men so that he might win some. And so mm -hmm. uh, that's what contextualization is. And the the even the gospels are contextualized approaches to telling the story of Jesus. All right. Matthew is to a Jewish audience. You see that with the genealogy. Luke is to a Gentile audience. You see how he, Luke goes, takes his genealogy back to Adam, you know, mm -hmm. and then Matthew takes his back to Abraham. Why? Because he's, he's trying to frame the, the story of Jesus in a way that connects to the audience that he's trying to, to reach so even the gospels are contextualized approaches um to wow. presenting the message of jesus mm -hmm. so i just think that you know to deny that um contextualization is not effective is to deny the how the bible even even was even was formed so um i just think you know when people it's interesting that when it comes to race and when it comes to things that 
kind of prick the hearts of people or touch or hit your front door. Mm -hmm. You kind of try to find a loophole. Um, But I think that should cause us to really confront the issue and say, hey, you know, maybe we need to do something differently. And the fact that there are not even a lot of black people in your audience should say, hey, that something should be done differently because maybe the way we're doing it is not effective. Is the Holy Spirit just not reaching black people or is it something we're doing? <laughs> right. You know? Um, right, right, right. <laughs> reaching a certain group, right? I got you. <laughs> That's wild. If, we're, if it's all related, if it all falls on the Holy Spirit. So, uh-huh. um, mm-hmm. Yeah, you made a great point. I hadn't, even, I've never even thought about that. You're right. I mean, the the gospels themselves, you know, there's some contextualization that goes on there. You know, and definitely with Paul. So, in a sense, if if we're not contextualizing, um, not just apologetic ap- apologetics, but just the preaching of the gospel, in a sense, it's kind of unbiblical to not do so, in a way. Mm-hmm. You know, since you do see that yeah. strategy throughout scripture, that's very interesting. I've never really thought about that. That's that's good. That's really good. Um. See, I'm glad I had you on the show. I'm learning stuff too. You know, that's that's what's up. You know. <laughs> um, so, what about um, as you kind of kind of going back to you, you mentioned the Afrocentric cults, and you know, we talked about the Hebrew Israelites. You know, they're really blowing up. Of course, you have like the Moors and the the Kemetic types, the Egypt, you know, Hotep guys. You know, what what does the church need to do to really uh, combat some of these groups? Because it, it does seem like they're they're growing. It seems like they're you know they're gaining some traction there. You know what do we need to do to kind of get on the front end of it and address the, you know the types of of things that are driving people towards those groups. Mm-hmm. I think we need a robust um, robust teaching of church history and uh, foundations of the church mm-hmm. uh, when people become members and when they become believers. Um, that needs to be in our church new members courses church history, infusing African church history in there, showing the importance of Africans, especially in black churches mm-hmm. and, his- and throughout church history and difference to a, a right understanding of scripture and how to interpret scripture. So a lot of errors come through just people not knowing how to interpret scripture, mm-hmm. taking the Bible out of context. In the words of Paul Copin, we can't always take the Bible literally, but we can always take it literarily. So mm. I, I, I interpret scripture based on knowing that I can not interpret Psalms the way I would ter- interpret the epistles. Mm-hmm. But a lot of people don't know that, you know what I'm saying? So we need to teach them really how to solidly understand and interpret scripture to read scripture and to, to know, have it know church history. And I think that would get ahead of these cults because the problem with the cults, even in you look at just like black Hebrew Israelites mm-hmm. or Hebrew Israelites, they like to be called. Um, right, right. They each group has different beliefs, so I can never necessarily nail down all their teachings because some, even within them, there's so much divisiveness. Mm-hmm. But if I know the truth well enough, I can interact with them um, based on the truth that I know. So many times, people are are easily swept away in counterfeit gospels because they don't know the gospel Mm -hmm. and um, they don't know scripture. They don't know church history and they haven't spent enough time with the truth to spot a lie. And so um, I think the way that the church gets ahead of this is to really equip people with the truth. And I know, you know, sometimes shallow and surface messages get people in the door, Mm -hmm. but those take people. And so in order to get ahead of that, we need to give people, we need to give them depth. And so my prayer is for the black church to grow deep and wide, like um, my friend Pastor Charlie Dates always says. Got you. Got you. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, because you got all kind of views out there, just just in the Hebrew Israelites alone. And then you have these other groups um, that also kind of all have their, you know, hang ups and, and uh, different perspectives, you know, Um I think, you know, kind of going back to something you said earlier, I mean, with social media, uh, I mean, goodness knows, there's just so much, you know, access that people have to these different ideas. And all it takes is one YouTube video <laughs> or maybe a meme, mm-hmm. you know, or something like that to get somebody, you know, going on some old other stuff, you know. Uh, memes are powerful, man. You know, if you can throw a mm-hmm. meme out there, somebody be changing their whole lifestyle just off of a, a meme they saw. You know, it's, it's really mm-hmm. it's really quite interesting. Somebody should do a study on that, like memeology or something like that. I think that'd be interesting. Um, 
So, yeah, you know, I definitely appreciate you coming on the show. Um, if you could just tell our folks, you know, how can they access what you're doing? You know, um, do you have any events coming up? Uh, stuff you got on the web? Just, you know, let folks know what you're up to. Everything is on Jude3project.com, and that's the number three. Um, we have an app that helps with biblical literacy. So you take a survey, and it kind of point points your strengths and weaknesses, and it sends you scriptures based on that and kind of helps you hmm. to grow in your faith. Um, that's the G3 Project Biblical Literacy app. Uh, we have a podcast. We have blogs. Uh, we have an ebook out um, by Cam Triggs, which is our director of urban apologetics. Mm -hmm. And also we have a, a tour hopefully coming up in 2017, um, trying to get all the kinks worked out, an HBCU tour called It's Christian and the White Man's Religion with Dr. Fence Bontu. Mm. Um, hopefully hit 12 to 15 HBCUs in the spring of 2017. Nice, nice. And um, we have an events tab to keep up with um, speaking engagements for our team and all of that. So we have suggested resources as well. And yeah, so everything and our social media links are on there as well too. Awesome, man. Well, I would definitely highly recommend y'all. Um, if you don't know, the Jew 3 Project, man, that's like the OG of urban apologetics or black <laughs> apologetics so you know i'm I'm just kind of one of the, the little guys man g3 is really putting it down so i would highly recommend um everything they do definitely all their resources i uh, want to thank you again uh, lisa fields for coming on the show definitely appreciate you and everything you share with our folks and uh so with that we got another episode in the books love y'all man all right thank you for having me scott i appreciate it absolutely all right